How many of you uh, would say that uh, your heart is stirred up afresh in the whole area of faith and operating at a high level of faith? Uh, and this teaching has helped you. How many of you would say that that's true in your life? Yes. Praise God. Awesome. That's wonderful. Uh, I've been listening of late again to some of Brother Hagen's teaching, or just to listen to the man himself is just always quite an experience. Of course, he's, he's lived and he's gone. Uh, he's gone to heaven, but his teaching is still around today. And how good it is uh, to uh, learn all over again uh, the whole area of walking by faith and what it means. Uh, and we've been journeying through a series of messages for the last couple of weeks. Today is our third uh, session, if you like. And we called this series of messages entitled Developing a Lifestyle of Faith. And I'm going to do a quick recap before we flow on. Uh, again, reading from Psalm 119, verse 33, where the psalmist said, Teach me, O Lord, the lifestyle prescribed by your statutes, that I might observe it continually. And of course, we said that God has called us to a lifestyle of faith. Uh, that is the lifestyle that God has called us to. And the, the psalmist here said, the lifestyle that is prescribed by your word, by your statutes. Uh, and we said that God has got three areas where we can learn this lifestyle of faith. Number one, uh, we see this lifestyle uh, written about in the word of God. We, read, we, we, we learn it through the reading of the word, through the preaching of the word. Number two, we see it in the life of Jesus Christ, that for all intents and purposes, Jesus was a faith man. Uh, all right, he was a faith man, that he walked by faith, uh, displayed a high, uh, uh, an example of high faith. And then furthermore, we learn faith by watching people in our local church family uh, who are elders and, uh, and uh, people that are mature uh, and, and, and leaders and so forth. And of course, all leaders are required. One of the major contributions that any leader in a local church brings into the mix uh, is to walk by faith, all right, because we are faith people. So the onus is on us to always stir up faith and to always be uh, living an example of faith so that those who are more recently born again, who still don't know everything, and, and even leaders don't know everything, but, but, but uh, new believers don't know anything. Uh, they're learning through the teaching of the Word. They're learning by the example that they're seeing by elders and people who are mature ones in the body of Christ as to what it means to walk by faith. And we said that this is the reason why when we get born again, God places us into a local church family, uh, and, uh, and that's where we learn how to walk by faith. Sometimes there's a bit of a tragedy that goes on, is when sometimes people say, oh, you know, it's all this stuff that I, I've already heard it all before, and, you know, for me, it's no longer so important to be in church now. He said, well, it is important for you to be in church because you need to be there as an example to the younger believers. It's a bit like, you know, like your parents might say, well, my kids are grown up now. I, I can leave home now and leave the kids to it. Uh, well, no, we're always there for each other. And, uh, you know, like uh, the God places us in families. And, you know, families, you got, you got older ones, you got younger ones, you got everybody in between, and God moves everybody together, and we're all journeying forward together. So we asked two questions uh, in the last two messages, uh, and we brought answers to it. The first question we asked was, how do we get faith? And the answer is, we get faith by hearing the Word of God. And then the second question that we asked was, how do you release your faith? And the answer was by speaking faith-filled words. Uh, and it stands to reason then that if faith comes by hearing, if we hear more of the word, more faith will come. And it stands to reason that if we release our faith by speaking faith-filled words, it stands to reason to say that the more faith-filled words we speak, the more faith we release. Many Christians are not speaking enough, or they're speaking the wrong things. Uh, and that was the content of last week's message. And this morning, I would like to speak to you about a third and equally vital aspect of faith um, that is so necessary for its proper working, and that is the action of faith. Everybody say the action of faith. All right, now we're going real slow here uh, in terms of uh, working our way uh, through a kind of a systematic, uh, systematic teaching uh, on faith uh, in regards to hearing uh, the word, uh, speaking the word, and now we are talking about the action of faith or doing the word. And so with that, I would like to swing into James chapter 2. Um, 
and bring a reading here. It's rather a long one. There's uh, all of uh, uh, however many verses there from verse 14 right through to verse 26. Uh, and this is what it says here. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, circle the word say, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions, can that faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and, and, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but you don't give him uh, or give that person any food or clothing, what good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Um, now, are you a little bit concerned by now, but certainly uh, James is telling us, or James speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that faith is not enough. Like, like what else is there? Well, he's about to tell us what else there is and make sure that our faith is actually working. He says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Now, someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds, but I say, uh, how can you show me your faith if you don't have any good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. Uh, you say you have faith, uh, for you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. Now, this is typical James style. Um, <laughs> uh, James is speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but if you like, I'm getting a sense that there is a personality coming through, that, uh, you know, sometimes you get, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspects of the word that are more diplomatic. Uh, James hits you right between the eyes. It's like just bang, you know, here it is. Uh, he says, even the demons believe and they tremble. So in other words, believing alone is not enough. You've got to add something else into that mix there to make sure that you, your faith is the genuine in article. Verse 21, uh, he says, how foolish, verse 20 rather, how foolish, uh, can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Now, I should point out here when he talks about good deeds, it actually speaks about an action. It speaks about a corresponding action to go along with faith. And we will develop that thought just a little bit further in just a moment. Uh, verse 21, don't you remember our ancestor Abraham uh, was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see, his faith and his actions worked together. And this is really the crux of the message, the crux of the matter, that there is faith, but unless action is added into our faith, then that faith alone is not enough, and it won't do the job, or it won't do the job properly. Um, so he says, uh, verse 23, and so it happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith, and he was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Uh, Rahab, the prostitute, is another example. Uh, she was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hid those messengers and sent them safely away by a different road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. Let's pray. Father, we once again want to thank you at this time for your presence in the house. We know you're here, for your word declares where two or three are gathered together, you are right in our midst. And Lord, we're here because we sense your presence. Uh, Lord, as the family of God comes together and as we worship God, you inhabit the praises of your people. And at this, this time, Father, we ask you to speak to us, to open the eyes of our understanding that, Lord, we're not here to get information, but we're here to get revelation. And we pray, God, that if there's any missing pieces anywhere, if there's any confusion anywhere, that the confusion gets cleared up, Lord, that the missing pieces will be uh, uh, put in there so that we can thoroughly and fully operate by faith in Jesus' name. Name. Amen. Amen. All right. Today we are discussing the action of faith. Um, James teaches us uh, about how to make our faith complete and how to make it fully operational by adding corresponding action. Uh, in the New Living Translation, it calls it good deeds. 
but we don't need to just get the the uh, the idea of just doing nice little good deeds here and there. You know, sometimes there is a kind of a concept where you do one good deed a day. You know, you're doing well, and it's good to do good deeds. But but James is really focusing on a corresponding action. Whatever the word says, uh, God wants us to speak it, but He wants us to also live it. He wants us to add corresponding action into the whole mix here. In verse 14, where we started out reading, uh, and again, it's back in your outline, separated out, verse 14. What good, it, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say, say, circle the word say. What good it is if, if you say? Now, last week we talked about saying. We talked about speaking. But, you know, the reality is that when we teach on faith, we can't get everything out in one, uh, in one message. We just can't do it. There's just too many components to it. So we focus on one component. That's why we teach in series form. And if somebody only gets one message in the middle of it, how do you know that they haven't got the whole story? All right, so, so that's why we continue on in this thing and drill down so that we get a full handle on every aspect of faith. You know, if you were to build a car and put the whole thing together and only put three wheels on there, it's just not going to run too well. All right, <laughs> or you put everything on there, you put a fourth wheel on there, but no steering wheel, it's just not going to run too well. So, so it is with faith. It's not like it's complicated or it's not like it's like, oh, wow, you know, just got to study this thing. You got to go to u- university uh, for six years and then you got to practice for 10 years before finally you can walk by faith. No, you're already walking by faith once the moment you're born again. The fact that you, you confess Jesus Christ as Lord of your life and you repented of your sin, your repentance is your action and your confession of Jesus is your faith uh, speaking, you're walking by faith. And that's where we start out. But then God wants us to develop this thing and turn this whole thing into a lifestyle of faith. All right? He says, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions. You see, faith must speak. In fact, I would like to suggest that if faith doesn't speak, it's not faith. And it doesn't take long to figure out where somebody is is at by getting around them and by hearing what they're saying. (laughs) You know, in the old days we used to say, strap a microphone around your neck and plug it into a recorder and then push record First thing in the morning when you start talking um, and, and, then, and then stop recording way in the evening when you stop talking and then the, the next day spend the whole day listening to what you've said. You'll soon know if you're in faith or not. <laughs> You'll soon know as to what comes out of our mouth because the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So faith must speak, all right. But if faith only speaks and it has no action with it, uh, James calls it useless faith. He calls it dead faith. Uh, and then he brings that famous uh, kind of uh, phrase that where he says that, that, that faith without works is dead. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. It's like just pow, you know, like, gosh, this is kind of, I don't know about you, but this is always a bit of a wake-up call for me. It's like when I come around to this point and say, oh, okay, just making sure that I'm not just believing and speaking, but I'm actually doing. It's in the doing of it that our faith is made complete and becomes fully operational and then is running at the capacity that God has intended for it to run. In James chapter 1, verse 22, that's the previous chapter, uh, James is still speaking about that. He's just developing a thought uh, all the way through here. And he says in verse 22, but be doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listening to it, or be merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. If you were to summarize the book of James um, into kind of a few sentences, yes, he speaks about speaking. He talks about that. In fact, he says, how is it possible that out of one spring, like in the natural, you've got a spring where water comes out. How is it possible that in the natural, you either have uh, you know, good water coming out or, or otherwise poisoned water? It's either one or the other. But with human nature, with our mouth, with the tongue, there is, uh, there is good stuff coming out and there's bad stuff coming out. And, and, and James says, this should not be. 
We wean ourselves off of saying certain things, certain words we will no longer use, certain phrases we will not repeat, certain sentences we will no longer, we will no longer speak because it's bitter, it's poisonous water. It poisons our life and it poisons other people's lives. And I've sometimes used a phrase when sometimes people say things, uh, I've sometimes used a phrase, look, I'd rather bite my tongue off than to allow words like that to come out of my mouth. My understanding that I have today of faith and for that matter of things like honor and various other issues, I'd rather bite my tongue off than use those words. Um, is everybody all right this morning? I'm, I'm actually happy, so I just want you to know I'm actually happy, all right? This is a happy message here today. I'm just encouraging you in some areas. It's, it's a little bit like, you know, just ha- having a little, a little brush up on some things to make sure that we're fully functioning. Uh, it's taking stock of our lives, uh, that we're not just got, uh, you know, two or three of the wheels, that we've got all f- four wheels so the car can actually run properly. And, of course, our speaking is in many respects the steering wheel of our lives. Uh, don't steer off the road. Uh, don't steer off, you know, like uh, off into the ditch there. I remember when I was a, a young boy of uh, 12, uh, must have been 12 years old, um, I went, uh, my uncle, um, in fact, he wasn't an uncle, he was just a friend of the family, um, he took me to confirmation, uh, and we had to go from our town into the next town because the bishop had come in, and the, all the young boys that were 12 years at that, that stage had to go through confirmation and everything. And some of you that are from Catholic background, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So along we went, uh, and this friend of the family had become my, uh, there's a word for it, I don't know what it is just now, it's basically uh, became my, uh, anyway, whatever you, you, you call that person. Uh, and I think part of the thinking is that if anything drastic were to ever happen to the family that he would bring me up and he would take care of me. That's sort of part of the, of the thinking there. So along we go in the car, uh, only about 10 kilometers from our town into the next town. We're tra- traveling along. There's a car in front of us and next minute, right before our very eyes, the guy veered off the road and ended up down in the ditch there. And it wasn't a four-wheel drive vehicle either. And so he just ro- rolled right off the road there. And by the time we stopped and went down there, uh, and uh, forget now the specifics of it. And back then, we didn't have cell phones, so we couldn't call ambulance or fire services or who knows what. But anyway, it turned out that the man had a bit of a hard turn, and he wasn't able to, to, to drive the car for, for that moment, and he, he ended up in the ditch. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just in a, in a careless moment, uh, uh, when the pressure comes on, they, they say the wrong thing, and it steers their life off of the road into the ditch somewhere. And then have you noticed it's, it's harder to get out of a ditch than it is when you stop on the road. It's better to stop on the road, not say anything wrong. It's just when you start saying the right thing, you're just moving forward again. But when you're in the ditch, it's hard <laughs> to get out of the ditch. You know, I got a four-wheel drive vehicle and then I, I go around the Wellington South Coast every now and then when I'm out there diving. And inevitably, before I leave, I bring a rope with me because there's always people that get stuck all the time. You know, get stuck all the time. In fact, one day I was out with my good friend, Cole Stringer. And when he sends me an email, he says, oh, are you still pulling people out of the ditch there? You know, four-wheel drive. They take those pretend four-wheel drives around there. You know, those stinky little things. Uh, uh, pretend four-wheel drive. And uh, then and they've got a pretend four-wheel drive. They don't know what they're doing, and then they get themselves stuck. And so, so somebody like myself comes along and a few others, and we pull them out again. And, and you know, we all ought to be able to pull people out of the ditch. Uh, and this is how we do it. Say, so look, uh, the words you're speaking right now is not helping you. And it's not helping me. It's not helping anybody. You, you, you've basically let go of the steering wheel of your life, and you're just, you know, if it's just a ditch and we can get the car back on the road, but you don't want to drive off a cliff. Uh, and, and, and so get a hold of, of your speaking. Get a hold of your speaking. That's what that's talking about. But furthermore, he says, be sure that you're actually a doer of the word. Obey the message. And this is really where we want to get back on track again. I got a bit off, off track there for just a moment. Um, so, yes, we must speak the word, but we must, must also do what the word says to cause our faith to become complete and to become fully operational. 
And so, for example, when Vanessa and I were young Christians uh, and we are reading the Word and we're all excited and faith comes and we're speaking and we say, this is it, you know, we're just going to go for it here. Uh, and then we read things like, uh, like you know, in, in Malachi chapter 3 where the Bible speaks about tithing and then in other parts it speaks about honoring God without giving and say, well, we're, we're going to be tithers. From here on, this is it. Uh, because, you see, we can't just hear uh, and speak and claim the promises without the doing of it. Uh, and so we decided that we was going to be doers of the word. And I'm glad to tell you, this is not about bragging on us, but it's bragging on the goodness of God and God's ability to provide that we have never missed a beat where our tithe is concerned, never missed a beat and, and typically give offerings uh, uh, beyond. Uh, and and so, 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 so therefore, it's in the doing of it, God says that the blessing actually begins to flow. And that's exactly what James says. He says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Uh, he says, and furthermore, he goes on, he says, and continuing the word, he says, it is the doer of the word or the doer of the work that will be blessed. And you know, there's a bit of a tragedy that's going on today where we have this thing, uh, you know, kind of this thing where people talk about grace and absolutely I believe in grace. And, you know, I'd like to believe that I'm a faith man and I'd like to believe that I'm a, I'm a grace man just the same because grace and faith flow together. Um, and so forth, but there's almost like a, a message going out, uh, and sometimes not so much in what's said, but what you might read between the line that people are almost like making out, it doesn't matter what you do because Jesus has already obeyed everything and you can enjoy all the benefits. Well, the reality is all of that flies in the face of what James is telling us in the New Testament, that we need to do what the Word says. It doesn't excuse us. Uh, grace does not excuse us to do what the Word says. Grace enables us to do what the Word says. Is anybody alive here this morning? Yeah. All right. So we need to do what the Word says. And that is the grace uh, of God that He empowers us and He helps us to do what the Word says so that the, the full blessing of God can flow in our lives and that our faith is actually fully uh, and completely functional. And then James moves on from there. And I say James because we are reading out of the book of James, which is a part of the Bible. But we could say the Holy Spirit is saying to us here in James chapter uh, uh, 2, verse 21, Don't you remember our ancestor Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scripture says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. So James is now giving us the example of two biblical characters. One of them is Abraham, used to be called Abram, now called Abraham. The other one is Rahab. Let's just speak about Abraham first. Abraham uh, is actually what they call a patriarch. Uh, Abraham is the founding father of the Jewish nation. Not only is he the founding father of the Jewish nation, but he's also, in a sense, uh, uh, our father, because the Bible says that Abraham is the father of all of us who believe. So we are all, the Jewish people are all natural children of Abraham way back, uh, and we are all the spiritual children of Abraham in a sense. All right? So it's just, just amazing, really, uh, the importance that this man holds in the purposes of God. Um, and Abraham, uh, when God spoke to him when he was in Ur of the Chaldeans up in um, Iraq, I guess, uh, present-day Iraq, uh, in that area up there, uh, that God spoke to him and says, come out of your family, come away from your family, come out of your country to a place that I will show you. And Abraham got up and he left. He took Lot with him, uh, which, you know, sometimes we have obedience, but sometimes there's disobedience in the obedience, that there's only a partial obedience because Abraham said, uh, uh, God said to Abraham, leave your family, and he takes part of his family with him. Now, God's not into breaking up families, you understand. And I'm not in any way suggesting that sometimes uh, that, you know, we need to just, you know, like, you know, disown family or get away from family. But sometimes, particularly with distant family, I'm talking, you know, husband, wife, kids always ought to be together and praise God for grandchildren, and his uncles. But sometimes it's helpful to, to have a little distance uh, for people that are a bit overbearing people that are speaking doubt and unbelief into your life, people that put you down, people that speak against God and against you serving God and everything.
everything. Sometimes, you know, it's just, just being careful. Anyway, God told Abraham, he says, come away from all of that to a country that I will show you. Amongst other things, he says, all the land that you see, walk through the length and the breadth of it. He says, I give it all to you. Um, and somewhere along the line, uh, Abraham says to God, he says, well, what he says, he says, what will you give me? He says, with all this thing, and who's going to inherit it all one day? He says, I've got this Eliezer in my house who's one of my servants. Uh, he's going to inherit everything because I got no children. Uh, Abraham uh, and Sarah, his wife, had no children. Uh, and God says, all right, this is what's going to happen. You're going to bring forth a child out of your own loins, and your wife is going to bear you a son. And, and it basically promised him that he was going to have children. Not only that, uh, God brought him outside, and he showed him all the stars in the sky. And he says, if you can number all the stars that you see up there, you're able to number all the children that you're going to have. Um, and then furthermore, God says to Abram, he says, all right, Abram, uh, this is my promise to you. Um, and I want you to change your name from Abram to Abraham. The word Abraham means a father of many nations. Um, and the word Abram just has a meaning of, in a sense, like a prince. You know, just one guy. But he says, you are now the father of many nations. And uh, what's amazing is that the Bible says that Abraham believed God. And God accounted it to him for righteousness. And in the New Living Translation here, it speaks about that, you know, he, he was made right with God because of his faith. But James tells us it wasn't faith alone as in simply believing and speaking. It was the action that he added into the mix that actually made the difference. So we need to realize that when God spoke to Abraham, he spoke to Abraham alone. And from that moment forward, Abraham was known as Abraham. So when he gathered the whole family together, uh, and he gathered his friends together. He says, all right, guys, I want you all to know that from here on, my name is father of many nations. And <laughs> there's no kids. There's no kids. Uh, which is really a step of faith in the sense of that, uh, that he added confession into the mix. He began to speak what God spoke. He added his agreement into what God had said. And see, part of our speaking is we're adding our agreement with the words of our mouth that we are saying exactly what God says. God says that we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. It's good for us to confess that we are healed by the stripes of Jesus and not be perturbed if we've got symptoms going on in our body uh, at the moment uh, because this is how we walk by faith. If we simply com confess the symptom, nothing changes. But when we begin to speak God's word over the symptoms, that's how faith begins to get going. And it's how we release faith. And when we add action into this whole thing, uh, then absolutely, uh, Absolutely, that's how our faith is made operational. Like, for example, I'm standing here today. My confession is that I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. All right, I had this tr something try to came on me a couple of days ago. And, uh, but I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. But I'm not, not only saying I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus, but I'm actually here today, and I'm fulfilling my responsibility of ministering the word to you, whereas perhaps I could have stayed at home. Uh, it wasn't you know, in, in any shape or form bad enough to stay home, but sometimes people are a little sniffle. Oh, I'm better going to ring the boss. I'm going to take a sickie today because I'm, I'm unwell, and I can't go out there, and I can't meet anybody, and people just are just too quick to give in to the symptoms. God says, you confess that you're healed, and then you act that you're healed. Right. I'm happy to tell you that I've never, in my 27, 28 years of ministry, never missed a speaking engagement. Never once. Once it came close on a Bible college evening, it came close. Like, it was real close. Like, I was, I was lying on the ground and couldn't get up. Uh, some back issue one Tuesday it uh, might have been a Thursday when we were running. I forget the day now. I don't know. It was Bible college evening, uh, and I needed to be there. I needed to lecture. And gosh, I, I just it really stamped my ground. Uh, <laughs> I stamped my ground. And I remember I was lying on the ground. I couldn't get up. and said, well, couldn't you be lifted up? No, but when, when, when stuff's really bad, anybody that's got any back issue and stuff like really bad, even somebody touching you just sends things off. And uh, I remember, I remember Tyring came to visit us on that day. And because he's got some, uh, some understanding in the whole area of physio and, you know, working out and so forth. And Vanessa says, why don't you go and fix his back? And, and he was wise enough to say, I'm not trained to fix his back. <laughs> and so we decided that we're just going to pray and believe God. And so anyway, um, I'm just leading up to say that uh, it was not very good at all. 
but I decide I've got a commitment and I need to walk by faith. You know, we don't want to be stupid about things. You know, like, you, like if, if, if you need to stay away or need to stay away from people or if you, you, you can't, you, you can't. You know, just got to do what you got to do. But, but, but confessing alone is not enough. We got to act healed. And Brother Hagen, as I say, he tells the story over and over, and it's just so inspiring. He had four, three incurable diseases as a young boy of 16 of age. He was lying on the bed, what he called his deathbed, because they had already given him up. But he, say, he calls it the bed of sickness. Uh, and then when he got healed, uh, and this is how it happened, he never felt any different, but he read from the word that he could say that he was healed, and he had to act on it, so he got himself off the bed while he was paralyzed. Now, I don't know how that's possible, but he managed to ease himself over to the side and he tried to get himself up and he crumbled uh, like a heap on the ground again so I had to come in and lift him back on the bed again and so he's up there again before too long he's off again you know he did that a few times and next minute he's healed and he was able to walk but then he was he was spindly thin like he was just uh, you know skin and bones because he hadn't walked in in years he says I'd I'd never run like a little boy Uh, he says because I was always so unwell when he was born they'd already dug a a hole in the backyard back back then out in the country because they'd already given him up and yet God had a plan God had a plan and then he tells the story how he is out working, uh, as, I guess as a 17-year-old boy, when he was actually up and running, and he was out working at some uh, garden center, some sort of uh, horticultural place. And part of their job was to dig out, uh, uh, to, to kind of rip out trees, you know, big enough that could be tr- replanted somewhere else and sold and so forth. And so he's out there spindling him, uh, you know, skinny himself with no strength whatsoever. And he'd start in the morning, and then he says, and some of these boys that fell out at midday, he says, early afternoon is I'm still there late in the afternoon and I kept on saying the Lord is the strength of my life and he says there were boys there said they said we're not going to make it through the day today it's too hot they got too much work for on he says why he says if the Lord is the strength of my life I'm going to go all day and that's what he did. And so, you know, you know, uh, the man got healed, not because suddenly there was a miracle in his life. And said, oh, oh, I feel so much better now. He walked by faith. It wasn't by the gifts of the Spirit that he got healed. It was purely by the working of his own faith. As we said before, the, the, the working of our faith is opposed to the working of the, of the gifts. I mean, it's no less miraculous, but it is less spectacular. And people like the spectacular and it's easier. <laughs> it's easier when somebody comes and does their thing and, you know, suddenly there, there, there's healing that manifests. But when we have to walk by faith and get up in the morning, just start confessing the word all over again and do what we need to do in order to walk by faith and to keep to our commitments. And uh, in fact, that's the whole message throughout the book of James whole message. Do what the word says. Don't just be saying it. Do what it says. And then he says, if you're an employer, he says, don't you go around, uh, he says, you know, mistreating your employees and ripping people off. He says, you have integrity in business. And further on in the New Testament, if you're an employee, he says, you put in a good day's work and you honor your, your employers or what they called their masters back then. And, and you know, don't, don't you be slacking around and, and taking home your pay without having earned it. And, and you see, Christian employers, employees ought to be the best employers and employees around because we treat people with honor. So that's the message throughout James. Say what the word says, but then do what the word says. Add action into your faith and this whole thing will be made complete. And so this is the deal. Like uh, uh, James tells us that it was not until Abraham, Abraham confessed that he was the father of many nations. He called himself Abraham, but it was not until he actually offered up uh, or attempted to offer up his son called Isaac that his faith was made complete, which is really amazing. You study that whole area there that one day God says, I want Isaac and I want you to bring him up on the mountain and I want you to offer him up to me in a sacrifice. Now, of course, God, God's never into human sacrifice. There's a particular reason for that, uh, which we may discuss some other time. But anyway, Abraham says, well, if that's what it is, then that's what we're going to do. You know, sometimes God asks us to do difficult things. But Abraham says, well, this is difficult, but I'm going to do it anyway. All right. And of course, if it were anything drastic, you never step out and do anything without talking to mature people around you to make sure you've heard right. You know, sometimes people do some very drastic things. 
You know, just very drastic things. And, you know, God's placed us in a family where we've got pastors and leaders and elders and mature people around us. Sometimes people just uh, randomly, oh, God's told me to quit my job. It's just, okay. Uh, and then they're, they're off work for months on end and say, well, was that really God telling you to quit your job? Or are you just trying to be more spiritual than what you really are? Oh, God's told me to do this. God's told me to do that. So you never do anything drastic because the Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. You get with people that you know in, in whom there is the Spirit of God and who are wise people and just use them as a sounding board. So I believe this is what God might be telling you. Be humble. Be humble. We hear it all too quickly. Oh, God's told me to do this. God's told me to do that. We hear it all too quickly. I don't like to use that phrase a lot myself. I might say, like, you know, I really believe that God might be saying this or might be saying that and put that word out there so that, so that because if somebody says, God told me to, to, to do this or to say that, how can you argue against that? Because in, immediately when you believe that it's not right what they're saying, immediately to, to speak against that, you immediately got a confrontation on your hands. And we ought not to be like confrontational with brothers and sisters. Uh, We've we got younger ones, we've got older ones. The older ones counsel, help to counsel the younger ones. Praise God. Anyway, now that you're shouting me down because I'm preaching so good, uh, I'll carry on for a little while. <laughs> so he flows on, uh, James flows on to speak about Rahab, the prostitute, uh, verse 25. He says, she's another example. She was shown to be right with God and her actions uh, when she hit those messengers and sent them away by a different road. You know, sometimes people judge certain groups of people or certain types of people more quickly and say, well, what? What? A prostitute? Yeah, well, she's no different than anybody else. Everybody has to repent. All right? And sometimes we've got things stacked in terms of severity of sin, but God doesn't see it in a like, light sin, you know, medium sin, heavy sin. God looks at it sideways. God says, you're all sinners and you all have to repent. And the biggest sin, biggest sin is actually doubt and unbelief. Uh, and the amazing thing is we read about Rahab who was a prostitute in the city of Jericho and Jericho was the first city that had to fall when the Israelites came out of Egypt came through the, uh, the, the wilderness and, and en route to go on into the promised land they had to take uh, the city of Jericho because that was the, the fortress that was the place that uh, needed to be tackled before they could move on further and what Joshua did was um, Joshua says, all right, I want two spies to go in and to spy out the land. Now, amazing thing is that 40 years earlier, now get this, 40 years earlier, Moses sent in spies. You know, Moses sent in 12 spies. And 10 of them came back with a message of doubt and unbelief. And two of them came back with a message of faith. And Joshua was one of those that brought a message of faith. So Joshua said, uh-uh, we're not going to be politically correct like uh, my predecessor was. Because, you see, Moses tried to be politically correct and said, well, you know, if we're sending in spies, we're going to pick uh, three spies out of three different tribes, then we're going to have uh, three, and, uh, and nine is, um, is 12. We've got 12 spies, so we really should have 12 spies, otherwise the other nine are going to be upset. And, you know, let's just be amicable here, and let's just be, you know, it's a little bit like a political move. And sometimes, sometimes we might be tempted to make a politically correct decision rather than doing what God tells us to do. And Joshua says, we're not going to send in 12 spies. We're not going to pick somebody from every tribe so that every tr tribe can feel good about it. We're going to send in two guys. And I'm going to handpick those two guys because I don't want them to come back with a bad report. Otherwise, we're going to be another 40 years in the wilderness. You think about that. You think about that. And there's a lot of politics that goes on in churches. And there's a lot of upsets uh, uh, because people just, uh, just, it doesn't take much to tip people tip people over. Somebody just overlook somebody or in, even in their own estimation they're tipped off already and they're already so ticked off and now upset and say, oh, you, you know, you don't recognize me and you don't recognize my gifts. You know, I'm, I'm really quite somebody and you haven't recognized that. You know, it's just politically correct stuff. Rather than the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, find it and, and, and put your hands to the plow and start serving and be a blessing. <laughs> So Joshua says, two guys, I'm going to handpick them. I'm going to send them in. So these guys went in. They had a good look around. Um, 
and uh, they ended up in Jericho, and they ended up lodging in the house of Rahab. So it would appear as though that Rahab, besides having a little business on the go, on the side there, she also offered lodging, uh, and so that's where they lodged. Uh, and uh, somehow, uh, she knew things that others didn't know. She recognized that these guys were different, and she recognized by the Spirit of God that these guys are two Israelites, and they have a covenant with God. And these are the people whom God delivered out of the most powerful nation, which was the nation of Egypt at that time, and they killed off a few of the, of the kings along the way here, and she, and she received them with, with, with peace, she says, which is really amazing. Uh, she received them, uh, and when the king heard that there were a couple of Israelites, Israelite spies, he sent men to inquire and to capture them and when they knocked on the door, she took these guys upstairs to the roof of her, of the building of her house that she was in. She laid flax reeds over them and hid them and they came in and said, oh, he's not here. And they said, oh, run over there. You might find him over there. She sent him off in another direction. The reality was she actually told a lie. Um, and I'm not suggesting that it's right or good or proper for us to tell a lie, but it's amazing how God still honored the woman's faith in the middle of her telling a lie. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, God's not looking for perfection. God's just looking for a heart that is open towards him and that believes. So all of that was going on. Um, and she said to the spies, uh, she says, look, she says, we have heard what your God has done for you. We have heard. We heard how God, and I'm paraphrasing now, how God decimated the armies of, of, of Egypt. We heard the kings of Og and uh, Shishon or whatever the other king was, how you slaughtered these guys and, and, you know, defeated that nation on the way out. And our hearts have melted and we're all scared and we're all afraid and now here you are. And she says, and, she says, and, and, and I know that your God is the real God. So she received them with peace. She's now confessing her faith. She had heard, and she's now confessing her faith. And she's confessing Jehovah as the real God. Rather than the gods that they serve, she's confessing Jehovah as the real God. And then the Bible says that when these men that had come to capture those spies, when they left, um, they, that she let these guys down by a rope uh, through the window of her house because her house was on the city wall and uh, she lowered the rope down so that they could not have to go out through the streets and out through the wall. She lowered them down on the outside of the wall and before she let them go, she says, look, promise me this, that when you come, I know you're coming. And I know you're going to deal to all, all of us here. But when you come, I want you to show kindness to me and kindness to my family. And I want you to, as it were, save me uh, and not slaughter me like you will everybody else. And the man says, all right, this is what we're going to do. We will, only, we will promise that we will do that. But the promise only stands if you don't say anything to anybody else. And the promise only stands if you bring all your brothers and sisters and all your father and your mother into your house. And uh, if you hang a scarlet thread... Uh, uh, a kind of a scarlet cord out the window so we know which window that you live in when we're coming from the outside and this is the only way that you're going to be saved. Which is kind of an interesting scenario that we've got to be in the house to be saved. Sometimes people are out of the house and they're just wandering around somewhere in the spiritual streets and they're not in the house. Uh, uh, we need to be in the house in order to be safe and secure. There's safety in the house. There's security in the house. And, of course, these two spies left. Uh, they went back to Joshua, reported back, and, and Joshua says, all right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to attack the city. We're going to walk around, and there's a whole faith story there with them shouting and confessing uh, and so forth and initially not saying anything at all. Sometimes not saying anything is better than saying the wrong thing. And then when they walked around on the last day seven times and they shouted with a shout of thing, the Bible says that the wall came down, and, they, and Joshua said to these guys, all right, I want you to go up to Rahab's house, uh, and I want you to bring out her, her, uh, her family, her father, her mother, all of her brothers and sisters, and bring them out to safety. And that's exactly what they did. She got saved. And the question now is, what was her faith action? And here it is, friends, and, and we're not going to go much longer, but if you, if you heard everything else and didn't get anything except you get this, her faith action was that she received these people in a friendly and in a peaceful manner. They were, for all intents and purposes, her enemies. 
you know, politically speaking, she, she had a, a, a responsibility to leave him there and, and run over to the king and say, guess what, king? We got two spies in my house and I've just tied them down. You need to come over and you need to deal to them. She says, no, let's not tell the king. I know that your God is the real God and I'm going to look after you and I'm going to let you down by the window. You're going to get away, but when you come back, I want you to look after me. She received them with peace, the Bible says. Uh, one translation says, she gave him a friendly welcome. See, when somebody comes to us, we ought to give people a friendly welcome. We ought to get them, hear them out. We ought to treat them with peace and with love. You see, you, as a believer, you treating people with faith and love is the best faith action that you ever can add into the mix. And let me tell you something else. You know, sometimes I sense there's a little bit of a change in me as well, but change just hits you right between the eye. If you're quarreling with somebody right now, you're not in faith. You got the pips with somebody and you're offended with somebody, you are not in faith. You might have heard, you might be speaking it, but you're not acting it. Your faith is not complete. It's dead faith and you'll be struggling to produce anything by faith because you haven't got the understanding that you need action in there. And our best action is to love people and to keep short accounts, to forgive people quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. The Bible says, forgive quickly. <laughs> Praise God. We're just bouncing around a bit now. A few more verses of Scripture, and then we're going to wrap things up. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. By an act of faith, Rahab, the Jericho harlot, welcomed the spies and escaped the destruction that came on those who refused to trust God. So how did you get saved? By an act of your faith. Not just by confessing that Jehovah is the Lord. She actually did something about it. And her welcoming these people with a friendly way for all intents and purposes. They were her enemies. But she received them. Uh, gave them a friendly welcome. Was kind to them. Ministered to them. Looked after them. And you know, the Amplified Translation says she had received the spies in peace without enmity. Without enmity. Jesus says, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples because you have love one for another. And of course, uh, he does not in any way suggest that there's never going to be any issues in the family when stuff is being said or done and everything, but you still, you have love one for another. You don't treat each other as enemies. You treat each other as friends with peace and with love. You are forgiving. Uh, you, 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 don't, you don't keep account uh, uh, and, and, and everything. You know, love, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter, is it uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love believes, love forgives, love trusts. Love does all of these things. It keeps no account of an evil uh, done to it. Uh, that is true love. So what was your faith action? Well, she received these people with peace and for all intents and purposes, received them with love. And when you and I do exactly that, that is the biggest and best faith action that we can ever add into this whole mix of hearing the word, speaking the word, and loving people. In fact, the two commandments uh, uh, that really only matter, there's a lot of stuff said in the New Testament, there's only two commandments that really matter. And they're like this. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. He says, this is the first commandment. And he says, the second is like it. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Two commandments, love God. Number two, love people. People say, oh, I love God, but I just can't stand people. Well, you can't walk by faith then. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love. Here it is, that our faith needs to be energized. Faith is faith, all right, but it's dead faith until it's fully energized through the action of love, through the action of living at peace with people and keeping short accounts and everything. And it speaks there about the activation of it, the energizing of it to make it fully operational in 
our lives. And I don't know about you, but I'm challenged by that. Praise God. I just want to be a doer of the word. I don't want to just go through the motions of saying all the right words and missing out on that very aspect uh, so that my faith is fully operational and that it is not dead faith. Uh, you know, dead faith is still faith, but it's dead. It doesn't do anything until such time that it is made alive. And this is how it's made alive, by adding corresponding action to our speaking and that we're absolutely able uh, to get this thing working and humming and functional in the way that God had intended it for it to do. Praise God. Did you get blessed today? Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for your word. At this time, we commit to be doers of the word. We don't just want to be speakers of it, declarers of it, though that's what we want to be, but we want to add action into this whole mix here. And so, Father, right now, we choose to love everybody. We forgive everybody that's ever harmed us. We keep short accounts. We will not let our anger, or rather, as it were, the, 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 for the sun to go down on our anger. We just let it go. You said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. If somebody needs to be dealt with or dealt to, you will do that. We let it go.